Young kids often have an incredible imagination that helps them create incredible characters and stories inside their heads. But then they grow up and that free spirit fades. But not Gene Yang. He never let his love of superheroes, animation, and storytelling dissipate. In fact, he made it into a stellar career. Gene is a renowned comic and graphic novel author who has written for iconic series such as Avatar, The Last Airbender, and Superman. Today, he is one of the most respected writers in the industry. His first graphic novel, American Born Chinese, was the first ever graphic novel to be named a finalist for the National Book Award and was the only graphic novel ever to win the coveted Prince Award in 2007. An advocate for using comics and graphic novels as learning tools, he's currently promoting his educational platform, Reading Without Walls, which encourages kids to read outside of their comfort zone. Jin Yang joins me now to tell us much more about his great work. Welcome to the show, Jin. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Wow. I'm excited to be here. I mean, talk about a list of achievements. Congratulations on all that. Thank you. It's, it's been kind of crazy. It's, it's kind of crazy, and, but it's great because you're doing what you absolutely love doing. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, when I started uh, making comics in fifth grade, I used to hang out with the, my best friend, Jeremy Kanyoshi. Okay. We would be at the lunch tables uh, making up stories. I'd do all the pencils, he'd do all the inks. Wow. And if you were to tell me then that <laughs> all of this uh, stuff would happen to me, I, I don't think I would have believed I know, so it was just innocent uh, kids just doodling, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, it really was. It was fun. I mean, we were very serious about it, but right. it was a lot of fun. Right, right. So I, I always have to ask, uh, you know, Asian Americans, fellow Asian Americans that go into fields that aren't the conventional fields, right? Because we have Asian American or, or Asian immigrant parents, right? Uh -huh. They all expect us to be lawyers, doctors, <laughs> engineers, yeah, that's right? The, that's the Chinese trinity, and doctor, lawyer, engineer. Koreans too, right? <laughs> so, so I wonder what your parents thought about you going into graphic novels. My, my mom uh, was a little more understanding. She's always had some interest in the arts. My dad is a pretty typical immigrant dad. Okay, so he, conservative. He was very into doctor, lawyer, engineer. Right. In fact, right before I, I went to college, he sat me down and we had this conversation. He said, you know, you need to major in something practical, <laughs> medicine or law or right. engineering. Chemistry, and all as that, long yeah. as you get that degree in something practical, you can do whatever you want with your life. And I won't say a thing. Really? So I did. I, I majored in computer science. Okay. It's also because I do, love, I do love coding. But I majored in computer science. After that, I became a software developer. I worked as a software developer for two years. During that two years, he didn't say anything. Uh, and then I left my software development job to start concentrating on comics and also to start teaching high school. And he didn't say anything because he promised he would. Still wouldn't. didn't say anything. Ooh. But every few months, I would get this little envelope in the mail oh. from him. And this envelope, it wouldn't have a letter or anything. It'd just have newspaper clippings. It'd be like, want ads from Apple Computer oh, or, or Google? Or, or it'd be like an article comparing uh, teacher salaries to programmer salaries. Oh, no. Every few oh. months, I'd get one. So subtle. <laughs> yeah, so subtle. Yeah, okay. It's so my dad, too. But they must be so proud now, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And, and the turning point, for my dad at least, was um, right after American Born Chinese came out in 2006, yeah. uh, a Chinese-language newspaper... Uh, came and and did an interview with me and featured me on on their like in the living section oh, you know wow. and uh, and when I went to visit him after that happened he actually had that article clipped out and laminated oh my and that's goodness. when those little envelopes stopped that's amazing that is amazing um, so let's talk about uh, you know the the storytelling part of what you do because that it's not just people sometimes think of graphic novels oh it's just a bunch of you know pictures and cartoons and things like that but there's story true storytelling in graphic novels right yeah I, I think in in America for a really long time when people thought of comic books and graphic novels they thought of only one genre they thought of superheroes right uh, maybe some funny animals but it was mostly superheroes right and and I think it's only within the last 10 20 30 years that, that things have really shifted uh, uh, that people have, have started realizing that uh, graphic novels are just, they're almost a container, and they're a container that can contain any kind of story that you want to tell. Right, right. When you write your graphic novels and you come up with your stories, I would imagine that a part of you is in some of these stories, or at least somehow you can relate to these characters. I, I think that's true of every writer. I think every writer, no matter how fantastical your story, you do pull heavily from your own life. You know, that's part of the research that you do is you just go through your memories right. and figure out what you can use. And what about American Born Chinese? Because that was such a huge hit, got such accolades, obviously. 
For you, what was that about for you to do that story? When I started American More Chinese, I'd been doing comics and graphic novels for about five years. And I'd always, I'd had multiple protagonists that were Asian American, but their cultural heritage never uh, played a big part in the story. Mm. So I wanted to do some kind of a story where that was the focus, where it was about cultural heritage. It was about the Asian American experience. And that's what American Born Chinese was. There are three different storylines. The first one is about the Monkey King, who's not my character. He's like this really famous... Chinese fable, yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, the second one, I pulled heavily from my own life. It's a fictional story about a, a young Chinese American boy growing up in a predominantly white neighborhood. Right. But that, I pulled heavily from my own junior high experiences. Right. Tell. Yeah. You know how it was a little rough, right? I think it's rough for everybody. I Listen, <laughs> Gene, you and I, I'm sure, have lots of stories about yeah. how rough it was to be an outsider. So when you were writing this and then you got the reception that you did to the book, were you surprised that... I was shocked. Yeah, you were Absolutely. shocked. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. When I started uh, in, in comics, it was the mid to late 90s. At that time, I don't know if you remember, but Marvel Comics had declared bankruptcy. Yes. And comics in general in America were just was, not doing very well. Yeah. Right. I, I would go to these comic book conventions with my friends. And, and some of the days at those conventions, there would be more exhibitors oh, no. than there were <gasps> attendees, which is the exact opposite of how it is now. Now it's right? crazy. Now it's crazy, yeah. But back then, people just thought it was a dying art form. Mm. So to go from uh, a situation like that to now, where, you know, there's a New York Times bestsellers list that's focused on graphic novels. Comic book conventions sell out months before they're held. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. So the way I pictured my life was I thought I would just teach high school full time okay. and I would always just do comics on the side. Wow, wow. But you never thought it'd be turned into something No, like this is... And then getting these kind of awards. Crazy. Yeah. All these awards. Nice. And then now you're... What is it? The National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. You were appointed by the Library of Congress. Yeah, that was, uh, that was a crazy thing. It was like one of the fanciest things I've ever been. <laughs> it it happened it? this past January. I flew out to the Library of Congress. They gave me the super fancy medal. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a lot of fun. But, but I really do feel lucky to be involved in comics, you know, when, when I'm involved in comics, like in this era. What is it, what is it about graphic novels that uh, makes it different from other types of illustrations and comic books? Well, I, I do think, you know, graphic novels are just one of many different ways that we can tell stories. And there are certain stories that just work better as graphic novels than they do in any other medium. For me, my attraction comes uh, from a pre-logical place. Like, I think I fell in love with graphic novels, and then I thought about why I fell in love, right? Yeah. But one of the things I appreciate the most is this interplay that you have between the visuals and the words. That relationship that the pictures and, and the words can have can be really, really complex. And you can, as a creator, you can really play with that complexity. As a reader, I think it gives your mind a little bit something more to, to hang on to. Mm -mm. You were once quoted saying, living a life without art, living a life without stories is a smaller life. Yeah, I, I think it is. I yeah. think it is. I mean, I, I just think storytelling is so fundamental to the human experience. Yeah. It's, we, we constantly tell stories about ourselves in our own heads. You know, we understand other people's uh, through stories, right. so it's, I, I, I think it's I think it's actually almost impossible to live as a human being. Right, without right. it's a way to exchange culture, social issues, you know, and environment. I mean, all sorts of yeah. ways that you can understand each other, right, through yeah. storytelling. Yeah. But here's my question, though: in this day and age of social media, where all kids are on their smartphones or their iPads or whatever, and they're just their attention span is getting shorter and shorter. Do you worry that, you know, this new generation is not going to be reading as much and they're not going to be as interested in stories? Yeah. I mean, I'm 42 years old, so I do worry about myself. I worry that my own worries are rooted in my old manness. You know? <laughs> You're not that old, Gene. Come on. <laughs> so, um, but but I do I do think about it. You know, yeah. I do think about how uh, kids these days are growing up in a in a much noisier world, and that noise isn't necessarily bad. It's just. There's, there's, there's a, a lot, lot of more distractions. Competing. Yeah, a there's a lot, lot more competing for their attention. Yeah. And I do think for books especially, you need that quiet place. Yeah. You know, and, and, uh, and that and, focus. And, and that focus. Book. And I think it's really good for you. I mean, they've even done research about it, right? Yeah. Like, like yeah. being able to sit down quietly with a book for an extended period of time is good for your brain. It's good for your spirit. Right. Uh, and, and I think, um, at least with the kids that I've met, they understand that. They, they get, like, if they've sat down and they've read a book for a half an hour or an hour or whatever, they know 
the difference that it makes in in themselves in it's, their own interior life they right? experience it. so I, I don't necessarily I feel hopeful I feel hopeful that this new generation has that same value for stories that well your platform reading without walls I mean that's all about encouraging kids to read but beyond that you're trying to get them to read uh, like I said before, outside their comfort yeah, zone. Yeah. So tell me about what you're trying to accomplish there. Well, the, the national ambassadorship was established in 2008. Uh, every term runs for two years, and every ambassador is encouraged to come up with a platform, something that they want to focus on. I had a meeting with the Library of Congress and with the Children's Book Council uh, last year, at the end of last year, and we came up with this platform of Reading Without Walls. Mm -hmm. What we mean by that is essentially what you said. We want kids to read outside their, their comfort zones. Uh, essentially, we want kids to explore the world through books. Exploration is such an important part of, of growing up, and books are such a great way of exploring. You yeah. know? Specifically, we want them to do three things. Number one, we want them to pick out books uh, with people on the cover that don't necessarily look or live like them. Second, we want them to pick out books about topics that they might find intimidating. Mm. So for me, you know, I grew up as kind of a nerd. I don't know if you can tell, but I was kind of a nerd. <laughs> no. I was not into sports at all. Okay. And I was especially not into basketball. Every time I played basketball, I You're got You're so hurt. tall. I know. That was the thing. <laughs> that was like, like, but height doesn't come with coordination. Okay, right? that's true. <laughs> Those two things are not genetically linked. That's true. So basketball has always been an intimidating topic for me. Okay. And I ended up getting interested in basketball in part because of books, because I read these amazing books wow. about basketball. And finally, we want kids to explore reading in different formats. So for a kid who's never tried a graphic novel, we want them to try a graphic right, novel. Right. And for a kid who only reads graphic novel, I want them to try uh, prose books or, or books in verse. Great goals, all three of them. All right, Gene, thank you so much for coming and you're doing great stuff. Thank you for having me. This was fun.